like, bro. She got, she got a kid. Look at his back. Oh my god. <laughs> Reaction. Uh, this is a Jordan B. Peterson reaction. Don't ignore your dream. Uh, like a few uh, Jordan Peterson reactions. He was one of the first people I was watching when I first started this channel. You know, so uh, it's always good to come back and see what he has to say. Um, having we've been gone for a while, but we're back now. Probably uploading again regularly. Uh, let me know down in the comments what uh, videos you'd like to see. Someone did tell me before in the comments that YouTube might be like doing something weird with people not being able to suggest certain videos. And if that is the case, you can just hit us up on let's be underscore blunt real. And then you can reach out to us there and then send us uh, links or whatever to a video that you want us to uh, see us react to. Um, yeah, but hit that like button, subscribe, and share, man. I really appreciate you coming back. We're going home right now who have claimed that dreams are mere, merely the consequence of random neuronal firing, which is a theory I think is absolutely absurd because there's nothing random about dreams. You know, they're very, very structured and, and very, very complex. And they're not like snow on a television screen or, or static on a radio. Like, those things are complicated. And, and then also I've seen so often that people have very coherent dreams that have a perfect narrative structure. You know, they're fully developed in some sense. And so... That just doesn't, I, that theory just doesn't go anywhere with me. I just can't see that as useful at all. And so, so I'm more likely to take the phenomena seriously and say, well, there's something to dreams. Well, you dream of the future and then you try to make it into a reality. That seems to be an important thing. You know, or maybe you dream up a nightmare and try to make that into a reality because people do that too if they're hell-bent on revenge, for example, and full of hatred and resentment. I mean, that manifests itself in terrible fantasies. You know, those are dreams, then people go act them out. These things are powerful. You know, and whole nations can get caught up in collective dreams. That's what happened to the Nazis. That's what happened to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. It was an absolutely remarkable, amazing, horrific, destructive spectacle. And the same thing happened in the Soviet Union. The same thing happened in China. It's like, we have to take these things seriously, you know, and try to understand what's going on. So Jung believed that the dream could contain more information than was yet articulated. You think artists do the same thing, you know, like people go to museums and they look at paintings, Renaissance paintings or modern paintings, and they don't exactly know why they're there. You know, I, I was in this room in, in New York. I don't remember which museum, but it was a room full of Renaissance art, you know, great painters, the, the greatest painters. And, thought maybe that room was worth a billion dollars or something outrageous because there was like 20 paintings in there, you know, so priceless. And the first thing is, well, why are those paintings worth so much? And why is there a museum in the biggest city in the world devoted to them? And why do people from all over the world come and look at them? What the hell are those people doing? One of them was of the Assumption of Mary, you know, beautifully painted, absolutely glowing work of art. And there's like 20 people standing in front of it looking at it and you think, what are those people up to? Why do those items become such high status items? What is it about them that's so absolutely remarkable? Well, we're strange creatures. So I was trying to figure out in part, well, where did the information that's in the dream come from? Because it has to come from somewhere, and you could think about it as a revelation, you know? Because it's, it's like it springs out of the void and it's new knowledge and it's a revelation. You didn't produce it, it just, it just appears, but that's, See, one of the things I want to do with this series is, like, I am scientifically minded and I'm quite a rational person and I like to have an explanation for things that's rational and empirical before I look for any other kind of explanation. And I don't want to say that everything that's associated with divinity can be reduced in some manner to biology or to an evolutionary history or anything like that, but insofar as it's possible to do that reduction, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to leave the other phenomena floating in the air because they can't be pinned down. And, and, and in that category, I would put the category of mystical or religious experience, which we don't understand at all. So artists observe one another. They observe people and they represent what they see and they transmit the message of what they see to us and they teach us to see. And we don't necessarily know what it is that we're learning from them. 
but we're learning something, or at least we're acting like we're learning something. We go to movies, we watch stories, we, 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 we immerse ourselves in fiction constantly. That's an artistic production. And for many people, the world of the arts is a living world, and that's particularly true if you're a creative person. And it's the creative, artistic people that do move the knowledge of humanity forward, and they do that with their artistic productions first. They're on the edge, and the dancers do that, and the poets do that, and the visual artists do that, and the musicians do that, and we're not sure what they're doing. Like, we're not sure what musicians are doing. What the hell are they doing? Why do you like music? Well, in regards to the first thing he was like actually talking about, the dreams and stuff, they definitely mean something subconsciously. Um, a lot of times I think they're just underlying thoughts, you know, things that you may put past you. Um, this, you know, it can be shit from your past, you know, because I've had very thorough dreams of people I remember, like specifically, you know, and I'll have like actual discussions with them, like one on one. And then, like, you got all this other crazy stuff going on. But I feel like whatever you're usually dreaming about the most can be a representation so consciously of what like you may have going on. Like I know for me, and I'm not necessarily even sure what it may mean, I fly a lot in my dreams. But when I actually do dream, I, when I actually think back on it now, I don't really be dreaming as much as I used to now. But when I do dream, a lot of the times I'm flying. Like, like it's gotten to the point to where like I'm actually like just know how to fly in my dreams now. Like, so I'm not necessarily sure if that has like an underlying meaning. Maybe you can let me know in the comments, but uh, Dreams definitely do play an intrinsic part of your life, I suppose. You know, it gives you a deep intimation of the significance of things. And no one questions it. You go to a concert, you're thrilled. It's a quasi-religious experience, particularly if the people really get themselves together and get the crowd moving. You know, there's something incredibly intense about it, but it makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's not an easy thing to understand. Music is deeply patterned. And, I, and, and patterned in layers, and I think that has something to do with it because re reality is patterned and deeply patterned in layers. And so I think music is representing reality in some fundamental way and that we get into the sway of that and sort of participate in being, and that's part of what makes it such an uplifting experience. But we don't really know that's what we're doing. We just go do it, and, 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 and it's nourishing for people, right? I mean, young people in particular, that, Lots of them live for music. It's where they derive all their meaning, their cultural identity. Everything that's nourishing comes from their affiliation with their music and is part of their cultural identity. So that's an amazing thing. The question still remains, where does the information in dreams come from? And I think what it, the, where it comes from is that we watch the patterns that everyone acts out We've watched that forever, and we've got some representations of those patterns. That's part of our cultural history. That's what's embedded in stories, in fictional accounts of, of the story between good and evil, the bad guy and the good guy, and the romance. You know, these are, these are canonical patterns of being for people, and, and they deeply affect us because they represent what it is that we will act out in the world. And then we flesh that out with the individual information we have about ourselves and other people. And the artists watch that, and, and they get intimations of what that is, and they write it down and they tell us, and then we're a little clearer about what we're up to. You know, like a great dramatist like Shakespeare, let's say, is, we know that what he wrote is fiction, and then we say, well, fiction isn't true. But then you think, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's true like numbers are true. You know, numbers are an abstraction from the underlying reality, but no one in their right true. mind would really think numbers aren't true. true. You could even make a case that the numbers are more real than the things that they represent, right? Because the abstraction is so insanely powerful. Once you have mathematics, you're just deadly. You can move the world with mathematics. And so it's not obvious that the abstraction is less real than the, than the, than, than the more concrete reality. And you take a yeah, work of fiction moment, like right Hamlet here. and you think, well, is that... It's, it's not true because it's fiction, but then you think, wait a minute, what kind of explanation is that? Like maybe it's more true than nonfiction, because it takes what the story that needs to be told about you and the story that needs to be told about you and you and you and you and abstracts that out and says, look, here's something that's a key part of the human experience as such, right? So it's, it's an abstraction from this underlying noisy substrate. And, and people 
are affected by it because they see that the thing that's represented is part of the pattern of their being. That's the right way to think about it. And then with these old stories, these ancient stories, it seems to me like that process has been occurring for thousands of years. It's like we watched ourselves and we extracted out some stories. We imitated each other and we represented that in drama. And then we distilled the drama and we got a representation of the distillation. And then we did it again. And at the end of that process, it took God only knows how long. Like, I think some of these stories, they, they've traced fairy tales back 10,000 years, some fairy tales, in relatively unchanged form. Yeah, that's not necessarily surprising. Uh, I've seen a lot of things where people were talking about like mythological stories or personal representations of experiences that are passed down through the human uh, species, like other species spread across the planet and we experience certain events, whether they're cataclysmic or they're wars or they're whatever, or, you know, um, a lot of times they'll not directly quote them in uh, direct historical text, but they'll use mythology, want to mythologize themselves, their civilization, make them, their civilization seem higher than what it may be. And two, just to be as a easier way to share that knowledge with future generations rather than necessarily just being like blunt facts i guess you can use the mythology as almost like a metaphor for the things that could have happened like uh if you want to talk about um great uh, cataclysms and the great flood and things like that how like the bible you know touches on those type of things and how there may have been a possibility that at some point in human history it could have been something that caused the flood that uh, may have necessarily led to further uh, people on the line, bringing this back up in their mythologies, like the Sumerians. We talk about these cataclysmic events, you know what I mean? And this flood and all this type of stuff. So, you know, be that. And it certainly seems to me that the archaeological evidence, for example, suggests that the really old stories that, that, that the Bible begins with are at least that old and likely embedded in a prehistory that's far older than that. And you might think, well, how can you be so sure? And the answer to that in part is that cultures that don't change, like the ancient cultures, right? They didn't change as fast as us. They stay the same. That's the answer. So they, they keep their information moving generation to generation. That's how they stay the same. And so we know, again, in the archaeological record, there are records of rituals that have remained relatively unbroken for up to 20,000 years. It was discovered in caves in Japan that were set up for a particular kind of bear worship that was also characteristic of Western Europe. So these things can last for very long periods of time. We're watching each other act in the world. And then the question is, well, how long have we been watching each other? And the answer to that, in some sense, is, well, as long as there's been creatures with nervous systems. And that's a long time. You know, that's some hundreds of millions of years, perhaps longer than that. We've been watching each other, trying to figure out what we're up to across that entire span of time. And some of that knowledge is built right into our bodies, which is why we can dance with each other, for example, right? Because understanding isn't just something that you, that you have as an abstraction. It's something that you act out, you know? That's what children are doing when they're learning to rough and tumble play, is they're learning to integrate their body with the body of someone else in a harmonious way, learning to cooperate and compete, and that's all instantiated right into their body. It's not abstract knowledge. They don't know that they're doing that. They're just doing it. And so we can even use our body as a representational platform. So we've been studying each other for a long time, abstracting out what is it that we're up to, and that's, that, that's what is it we're up to, what Go to Peterson, level 99 after, uh, for sure. But uh, interesting topic that you're touching on now. Um, I think it's just an intrinsic, inherent nature of which, whatever you want to call it, evolution, you know, a continual evolving of a species. You know, you'll see certain traits or, you know, just certain things begin become to be more and more um, eventful as, you know, a species continues to grow or whatnot. Like um with those mythologies, those stories that we we're talking about that may have be linked to certain past events, those can be used to teach people in the future. You know what I mean? So uh yeah.
Let me know other videos you want to see down in the comments. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate everyone who come back to the channel, man. I know I've been gone for a while, but uh, we're back now. I'm going to be uploading at least two uh, videos every two days. You know what I mean? So we'll have some content coming up for you guys. But hit that like button, subscribe, and share. I'll see you next time. Oh, no, no, no.